Let's stand together and we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 21. We'll be reading verses 1 through 11 as we open, and then we will pray. Matthew chapter 21, 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of, a bur- of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. Most of the, of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let us pray. Lord God, We simply ask, whatever this means, Lord, we ask that you have your will and your way in this place, in your people today, even now. Have your will. And Lord, I pray that we all pray this from the bottom of our hearts. Have your will in me. Use your word in me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So our passage this morning brings us to the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of our Lord's Passion. And since the moment of the confession of Peter, that Jesus Christ is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus has been foretelling this since that moment, that he would go to Jerusalem and he'd be turned over to, re- to the religious leaders and tortured and killed and would rise again on the third day. We see him speak of this just a few verses earlier in Matthew 20, verse 17 through 19. And it makes me wonder what the disciples were thinking as they entered Jerusalem and Jesus received such a welcome? Did they, like Peter, doubt their Lord's predictions? What a glorious greeting to see Jesus proclaimed by their people. The disciples, they knew who he was. Jesus had revealed himself to the Samaritan woman. He had confirmed the confession of Peter. They knew who he was. But to hear, to hear these things shouted from the voices of the crowd, it must have made their hearts sing. I'm reminded of a couple different things this makes me think of in my own life. First off, (laughs) what brought to my mind right away was when... uh, when I was just a Christian a couple years, I was still a metalhead. If you don't know what a metalhead is, it's a, it's a person who's really into heavy metal. Heavy metal music. Not, yeah, not heavy metal forging. <laughs> heavy metal music. You know, I wasn't into that REO Speedwagon, Air Supply, soft rock stuff. No. Or country. You know, the easiest way to get me to jump out of a moving vehicle is to put on a country music station. Um, <laughs> sorry for you country fans, um, but <laughs> well, I like country now. I've, you know, you grow in your music taste. Anyway, um, so I was a heavy metal guy. You know, I was saved out of that, and I was saved 
uh, part, God used it actually to, to perk my ears up to Christian bands who sang that kind of music. And, you know, I had hair down to here and um, wore black all the time. And, um, you know, I got sore necks from all the headbanging. And just, I'm giving you a bad picture of me right now. But, but <laughs> this is who I was. And this is uh, what I, this is my crowd. This is who I hung out with. And I remember one time, early in my years in, as a Christian, going to this Christian music festival. And this type of music is being played. And, of course, I go to those, those concerts. And gathered around me are all these long-haired people, guys and girls. Um, and uh, they're singing Hosanna in the highest. And they're raising their hands in praise and falling to their knees, singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. You know, that blessed my heart to see my people, (laughs) who, very rebellious crowd, yielding to the King of Kings. And I remember other times, Many times I've repeated over and over and over and over again where we go to a, a youth conference and thousands upon thousands of youth are in this, are, are in stadiums. And there's always one guy who comes up and revs up the crowd, right, Rob? You've been there, buddy. And uh, always revs up the crowd, do you love Jesus? And everybody's like, yeah! Huge cheers. And I always wonder, with everybody screaming how much they love the Lord in the thousands upon thousands of people, Lord, if just this group was fully committed to you, if just the thousands in this stadium fully dedicated their life unto your use as you defined it, what would happen? But that's never the case, is it? And so here we have a crowd of people shouting Hosanna in the highest. And so this crowd was made up of devout Jews of Jerusalem and the surrounding area who were in Jerusalem for the observance and the celebration of Passover. And each year during this time, the people strive to obey God by journeying to the city to observe this holy celebration remembering that God had delivered his people Israel out of Egypt. And so the city was full. And now, with God's deliverance upon their hearts and minds, the people see in Christ a new deliverer to deliver them from their new oppressors. And they are in celebration They are shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. And so Hosanna is both a plea and a praise. It's saying, as John mentioned, it's saying, save us. But it's also proclaiming the divine power to save. Save us, you who are able to save, Son of David. And Son of David was a purposeful proclamation by these people. It was more than proclaiming or saying that Jesus was like a great king, like David. Son of David was a title reserved for the Messiah. They knew that Messiah, according to 2 Samuel chapter 7, would come from the line of David and would establish the kingdom forever. And so here we see Jesus allowing the people to proclaim him Messiah, coming king. We read earlier in his ministry, following the miracle of the feeding of 5,000, we read from John chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, when the people saw the sign that he had done, the feeding of the 5,000, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to take him and by force make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So up to this point, we see Jesus often telling people that he healed or those who believed upon him 
shh, keep it quiet. Don't tell anyone. Now, there are some exceptions to that. But in general, we see Jesus throughout his ministry being very observant and protective of his father's will regarding the time of his sacrifice. And now that time is almost upon him. And for the first time, we see crowds proclaiming Jesus as Messiah and Jesus allowing it. And not only does he allow it, but he himself proclaims it. He rides into the city on the back of a donkey. But why a donkey? Well, Pam and I were talking before service, and the Israelites associated the coming of a king on a donkey as a symbol of royalty and peace. But a king who comes into the city on a horse was seen as a conqueror. Jesus, by riding into the city on a donkey, he fulfills the prophecy that is mentioned here, and it's from Zechariah chapter 9 and 10, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now listen to the contrast of verse 10 from Zechariah 9. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so we see here the prophet inspired by God to purposefully contrast the rider of the donkey, come in peace, contrasting those who ride horses and chariots to war. But this humble king will break the power of the nations and he will speak peace to them. Jesus is the word. He knows the word. And he chooses to proclaim himself as the one coming in peace to proclaim peace. Mark tells, a little, tells us a little bit more about the donkey in Mark chapter 11, verse 2. And he said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. That's a wonderful thing about the donkey, and I'll explain it to you. This colt had never been ridden, which tells us that it hasn't been broken in. Donkeys were considered useless until broken in. Useless for work or transportation. Almost wild. Mark implies that this donkey, having never been ridden, was just such a donkey. This colt wasn't useful yet. And so even in the selection of this donkey and colt, we see the care and the love and the grace of our God. The Lord uses the unexpected, the weak, the foolish. Even in the fulfillment of prophecy, Jesus uses what will bring God the most glory. The crowd didn't know about this wildish, perhaps useless, state of the cult. But God knew. Beloved, you may feel useless. You may feel untrained, unprepared, insufficient for the task. But beloved, it is when we come to that realization, when we recognize that we are not fit for his use, and we are utterly dependent upon his power, it is then that he can truly begin to use us for his glory. 
you may feel useless, but God in his grace desires to use you, whatever state, to bring Jesus to your Jerusalem. And I would venture to say on the opposite side of that, that when you begin to think you're all that, you make yourself useless to the Lord. Jesus rides into the city. King, come to proclaim peace. And Pam told me this neat thing about donkeys that I didn't know. Do you know that donkeys are the only animal with a cross on their fur? They have a a cross down their length, a, a line of black fur down their length, and across their shoulders. The glory of God. And Jesus rides into the city. King, come to proclaim peace. But not the peace that those in Jerusalem thought. He is the king come to buy peace. To buy reconciliation of man to God and to pay that cost by his blood. He comes for peace this time. He came this time in peace, riding on a donkey. Revelation 19 tells us that when he comes again, he comes for war, riding on a white horse as conqueror. He rides into Jerusalem for peace. But again, this peace that Jesus came to achieve was not the peace that the people expected. I dare say that most of them missed that peace because they were blinded by their own expectations and bias. Let's turn to Luke's account of the triumphal entry. In in Luke chapter 19, we're going to read verse 39 through 44. And some of the disciples in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The Lord is proclaiming himself. His time has come. His hour is upon him. And he knows that every step into the city is a step closer to Calvary. And no one takes his life from him. He lays it down of his own accord. Continuing the verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city... He wept over it, saying, Would that you even now had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Note that word because. Even as the crowds gathered to shout his welcome, even as the Pharisees are appalled at Jesus receiving his due praise, our Lord weeps because he knows they don't understand. They don't see him for who he really is. They don't know the time of their own visitation. They don't know that the Son of God is in their midst. Their expectations of what Jesus, what the Messiah should be, kept them from knowing the very one they proclaimed. Beloved, we ought to take these verses seriously and soberly. For if the word of God is true, as we say we believe, then the very destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem and the glorious temple of Solomon was due to the fact that these people did not see Jesus for who he really was. Though they hail him as king, as Messiah, they themselves were indeed the definers of what those titles meant to them. And they missed the real Jesus. Their counterfeit conception of Christ robbed them of the truth that would have set them free. And so as the people rejoiced, Jesus wept. And 
So what does our Lord do with this newfound admiration? This newfound adoration? This newfound adulation? I couldn't think of any more ad words. What does our Lord do with this newfound power? Turning back to our passage in Matthew 21, continue on from verse 12 through 17. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the temples of the, the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. And after leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So immediately upon entering the city, immediately after receiving the praise and the following of the crowd, where does Jesus go? He goes to the temple. His only concern was the reconciliation of man to God, his father's purpose. And here he is with the power of the people behind him, proclaimed King, by the voices of the crowd, here he is in an opportunity to seize earthly power, to take Jerusalem as his throne. And what does he do? He does not march on the Roman garrison. He does not gather the leaders and hold a military summit. He goes to the temple. And he does not go to the temple to give a great speech, to win the people to his political or military banner. No, he goes to the temple and he cleanses it. Now, the cleansing of the temple deserves its own sermon. We've covered it in great detail in our Sunday school class on the tough teachings of Jesus, and you can find that at Detroit Christian Chapel's YouTube. But to cover it briefly here, Jesus cleanses the temple because the very worship of God was being used to take advantage of the people of God. And the place where that was happening, was itself dedicated to the worship of God by the Gentiles. So by cleansing the temple, Jesus again proclaims why he has come, to reconcile all of humanity to God. What he disrupts in the temple is an established method of money-making that feeds the power of, Listen, listen to me on this, that feeds the power of the very people that if Jesus had been politically savvy, he would have wanted on his side. In fact, Jesus was far more wise than we are. He knew the trouble that he would bring down on himself. He knew the way to win the nation to himself. He knew what he could do to become an earthly power. An earthly power as had never seen. That would make Genghis Khan seem like a bully and nothing else. That would make the Roman Empire seem minuscule. Jesus knew what it would take to accomplish that under his banner. On earth. At that moment. Not only did he have the genius to do so, But he, listen to this, he had the host of heaven at his call. But he did not come to fulfill an earthly cause. He did not come to free his people from Roman or even Jewish earthly oppressors. He revealed, he was, he lived, he died, he rose again to reconcile you and me to God. He came to buy us back to abundant life. He lived that abundant life. He is that abundant life. He is that eternal life. And today, even now, he offers it to all who would receive him. 
John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But I want you to notice from John 1, 12, what Jerusalem missed. Jesus wept because Jerusalem missed the hour of their visitation. He wept because even as he walked in their midst, they missed him. The real him. And the vast majority did not receive him. And so just days later, another crowd, perhaps containing many of the same people who hear cry, Hosanna. Another crowd cries, crucify him. Just days later, the people of this same city, again, perhaps some of whom hailed him as coming king, just days later they cry, we have no king but Caesar. Pastor Gino Garacci says this, for the person who celebrates the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but remains the king or queen of their own life, For all intents and purposes, they say, we have no king but ourselves. These ones in Jerusalem who end up denying and rejecting Christ, they reject Jesus because he is not who they want him to be. Beloved, I worry sometimes that we might do the same. That we have filled our minds and our hearts with this picture of Jesus that is not the biblical, actual Jesus. We have no problem with the meek and mild, humble Jesus on a donkey. But the one who overturns tables in the temple of all places, that Jesus, that Jesus makes us uncomfortable. Or maybe vice versa. Maybe we love the table turner, but we have issue with the friend of sinners. Like Jerusalem, the world and Lord have mercy, even we are in danger of missing our visitation. Missing the real Messiah because we are looking for a Messiah that reflected our personal comfort level or convictions. But Jesus is who he is. He is the one and only way. He is the truth, the truth the really real. He didn't say, I know the truth. He says, I am the truth. He is the amen. He is the only abundant life. Jesus, the really real, not the Jesus we are comfortable with. Jesus as revealed by his own words and his own life in his word. To not miss our visitation, to receive him, we have to receive him. I'm reminded of premarital counseling where we give people that come and are about to get married, we give them a whole survey about each other. Why do we do that? To see if they know one another. Because so often, marriages fail because they don't really marry the person. They marry their perception of the person. God desires you to know him as he is. And that is the only truth that will set you free. And church, this is not merely a momentary decision. We can miss out on what the Lord would have for us in each of life's moments. In every moment, we can choose to either receive him or reject him. In every relationship, in every conversation, in every life decision, we can receive him or because our eyes are fixed on our own expectations and bias, we can miss our visitation. We can miss out on what God wants to do. And what a tragedy that is. Beloved, God desires for you to be free. For you to have life and life 
abundant. For you to have victory and peace and power and his very real presence in every moment, regardless of what the world and the powers of the world might bring. The freedom that Christ wants to give you is a freedom that cannot be touched by any earthly power, including yourself, if you surrender to the Jesus that is really real. All you have to do in the moment of your rebirth and in every moment after, even now, all you have to do is receive him. So as the worship team comes, I want us to do one final thing together. We're going to receive our king today. And some commentators believe that the procession of Christ through the streets of Jerusalem was known as the antiphonal, as an antiphonal procession. That the people in the front would cry, Hosanna to the son of David. And the people in the back would repeat, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And the people in the front would say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the people in the back would repeat, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so on. And so I want us to make that our prayer today. Let's stand and we're going to cry this out to the Lord, receiving him as king into every aspect of our life. I will take the part of the people in the front and I'll say a phrase and you will shout it back to the Lord Most High. And by doing that, I pray. You know, sometimes shouts we see in Scripture, they have power to break down walls to break chains. And today I want to venture to say that perhaps some of us have been enslaved by a false Jesus, by concepts of comfort, that we have held on to, not realizing that they have kept us back from life and life abundant. And so as we shout out our Lord's praise, I pray that as we do so, we, ent- we also are releasing everything that has held us captive and inviting him in to truly deliver and save us. And so let's begin. Hosanna to the Son of David! Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. 